You're listening to Bible Truth Feed, a podcast by Christadelphianvideo.org for Christadelphians and all those seeking the truth about the Bible message. Join us now as we present our latest episode. The Holy Spirit is, is a subject that differentiates us from a large part of, let's say, Christendom and other faiths. So it, it's quite important that we understand what the Bible is telling us uh, and we can understand how others may look at the Holy Spirit and maybe get the wrong end of the stick. Um, this is a photograph that I took in Cameroon. Um, and, and you see lots of posters like this. I took it a long time ago, so you won't have seen the poster before. But it's interesting, this, this guy is obviously wanting to fill a football stadium, I think, I think it says that somewhere, uh, with people who will come and pay money and make him rich. But my cynicism shouldn't prevail. The key point is this, he makes this statement, as the master arrives, be assured that salvation, deliverance, restoration, Holy Spirit, baptism and healing, such as crippled, blind, deaf, dumb, tuberculosis, asthma, HIV, AIDS, and every incurable disease will be healed. And that was just one night in Douala. You got all of that. <laughs> um, and, and in a way, this sums up our, our, our difference from Christendom. Because as, as Christadelphians, we, we don't believe that the Bible teaches us that the Holy Spirit gifts are uh, available and possessed today. And, and there are other people out there who say, well, look, I, I can do all of this through God's, God's Holy Spirit. And we have to work out, well, what's right, what's wrong? So what I want to do is have a, have a quick look at a Bible basics. So we're going to start in Genesis. We're going to look at the Hebrew word, ruach, which means um, uh, breath. We, we're going to have a look at the, at the New Testament word. And, 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 and so on and so forth. So we'll put those together and then we'll look particularly at the Holy Spirit. So to start with, let's turn to Genesis. And this doesn't take any great extension of um, thought process. The Bible's quite clear. It's the very beginning of the Bible. And we could probably quote it without having to turn it up. So we know that in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. So, so this is the Bible's claim. This, this is God's creation. And, and the scene is set for God's creation of the heaven and the earth in verse 2. The earth was without form and void. Darkness was upon the face of the earth. So, so there's no shape or form to the earth and there's no light. It is all dark. But the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. So God's, God's spirit, God's breath, the breath of God as it were, is omnipresent it, it, it's evident everywhere across the face of the waters that cover the globe and from that position we see God says and there was creation on on each of the six days that leads up to the seventh so at the very simple starting point the spirit of God is not some third part of God as the Trinity or Trinitarians would have us believe it's literally described as the power of God. It was God's breath that, that prevailed across the world when creation occurred. Now, if we go to chapter 2, verse 7, we see the practical application of this. The Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So the same pattern exists. So whereas where's God's breath was present across the waters of the world, now God's breath is blown into the nostrils of this clay man, and this clay man becomes alive, and man became a living soul or a living being. Now, to, to, to go to the opposite point of that, go across to chapter 6. A lot of time has passed since creation in, in chapter 1 and 2, and where we are in chapter 6, because we're now considering Noah and, and, and the, the judgment that God brings to pass on the world. Um, but I, I just want to pick up verse 17. Um, Behold, 
I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, wherein is the breath of life. From under heaven and everything that is in the earth shall die. So again, if you remove God's power, if you remove the breath of life, then death is the result. So, so with God's power, there is life. When that power is removed, then the, the breath is extinguished, then there is death. So that's just a simple point. But what I want to do is just establish the power of God being shown as the Spirit of God. Now, if we go down to Psalm 65 now, we, we, we just get, as it were, a, a catch-up on, on what we can see. So if we go to Psalm 65, and I'm hitting you with lots of references quickly, but hopefully the pace will slow down in a little while. Um, Psalm 65, and, and this is just as it were a summary of the point that I'm trying to make. Um, verse 9. You, God, visit the earth and water it. You greatly enrich it with the river of God, which is full of water. Thou preparest them corn when thou hast so provided for it. Thou waterest the ridges thereof abundantly. Thou settlest the furrows thereof. You, you make it soft with showers. You bless the springing, the, the springing thereof. And, and then verse 11, you crown the year with thy goodness and thy paths drop fatness. And, and, and that's the harvest that we are sort of enjoying after a fairly dry year here in the UK now. So why do I go to this reference? Because this is the conclusion. The conclusion is that with God's power, the world, it's a phrase we use a lot as Christadelphians, is sustained. And, and God's power maintains what's going on in the world. And God can order the kingdoms of men if we were to follow a, a different sequence of passages. But God's power is present in everyday life. It's present in the creation, the, the seasons, and all that we can see in the world. And that's nicely established in Genesis, and, and the psalmist confirms it very clearly. So that's the Old Testament introduction. Let's go to the New Testament introduction and jump to Acts chapter 17. And again, there's a, a little flurry of references, but we're just doing the, 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 the hard work as such, okay? So... Acts chapter 17, and for, for those of you who are quick thinking, already know that this is about Paul and, and uh, the, the Mars Hill incident, which is recorded from verse 16 onwards. Um, and here we, we, we're talking about the way the world was in what was then civilised Rome, albeit Athens is Greece, but it, it's the, the, <laughs> the kingdom of Rome. Now, what do we see here? Athens is, as it were, an, an, a university town. It's full of learning. It's full of lots of forward thinking. And it's full of the, 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 the cutting edge of um, uh, Roman and Greek philosophy. And none of it is to do with God. And how does Paul see this? Verse 16. While Paul waited for, let's say, colleagues, and, and we can see that from above, Silas, Timothy, um, in verse 15, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. So how do we understand that in modern English? His spirit was stirred in him. You could say he, his emotion was running high. You could possibly say he was angry. Um, his motivation what, what was, what was roused. He didn't like the idolatry and ungodliness that he saw. Now that word there is the word pneuma, and, and again, it's a very similar word to the Hebrew word uh, ruach for breath. And, and if you think about breath and wind, and you think about pneuma, you might think about a pneumatic drill, which was going at, at about half past ten before our meeting this morning. Um, and, and that's obviously the compressed air. So you can understand the logic of the words. Um, and I think if, if any of our uh, Farsi friends were here, the the the, the Farsi word is very similar. I, th I think the word is wind, and and the logic of language sits there quite nicely. But 
the the key point is Paul, Paul's uh, spirit, his motivation in this instance, his emotion, is raised. Let's go across to the next chapter, Acts chapter 18 and verse 25. Um, verse 24 for introduction. A certain Jew named Apollos, he was born at Alexandria, he was an eloquent man, mighty in the scriptures, and he comes to Ephesus. This man was instructed of the way of the Lord, and being fervent in the spirit, well, he, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. So here we, we, we can see there's a slight difference in the way the word is used. Um, but the key point is, again... He was fervent in spirit. So from Acts chapter 17, where we're looking at emotion and motivation, you could say the same here. I think that the, the Greek word for fervent is hot. He, he was heated. He, he was enthused about the scriptures. And he wanted to speak and teach these things diligently. So, again, the point is clear, and, and the meaning and the use of the word is simple. Um, we, we, we could go down to Acts, uh, Romans chapter 1, and, and there we look at a passage about Paul and his desire to serve. Um, but in summary, I think that we can look at the way that word is used in the New Testament and, and see how Paul's spirit, the word spirit, is being used. Slightly differently, but it's a clear, understandable meaning. So we've got an Old Testament meaning and, and we've got a New Testament meaning. How do we put these together? Well, here is a very simple understanding. So, third word, I'm going to throw some Latin in. And, and <laughs> to breathe there is spiro. And we know that in spiro it, it is of the same uh, sort of uh, Latin base. So if we go to 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by the inspiration of God. So the holy scriptures that we have are God-breathed, okay? And, and we can put the language and the meaning together, and it makes sense. How is that used elsewhere? Let's, um, well, I, I don't need to turn it up. Let, let's just leave it on the screen. But 2 Peter chapter 1 confirms that view men spoke from god as they were carried along by the holy spirit now that's interesting so scripture is god breathed and men have written it down with the holy spirit and we have to understand what that means for us to start with the word holy really means to be separate or set apart from, to be dedicated to. So if we understand a separate spirit, and we think about the Old Testament and, and the God's power, and then we think about inspiration of Scripture, God breathed, well, we can see that God's power given for a specific use, in this instance, to write the Scriptures. Now, what I would like you to do here is to turn up Psalm 51, because I, I think this is a, a, a really nice little passage. I think it's this one. Um, let's have a look at Psalm 51. No, this isn't it, but I'll come to the, 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 the psalm I mean in a bit. But this is just confirming that the practical understanding that the psalmist had. And he says, Rejoice unto, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. So, so here we see God's power used deliberately here to, to support and maintain the psalmist. Um, and we could see a similar picture, I think, in, in 2 Samuel. Um, I'll come back to that other psalm in a bit. I'm going to turn to the New Testament again now and see where the Holy Spirit 
is used specifically. And, and we read from Luke this morning, didn't we? And, and we're going to just pick up a couple of passages at the beginning of Luke. Again, nothing that you don't know. This is concerning the virgin birth of Jesus. And we, we understand the passage. The Holy Spirit shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore, also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. So if, if we're understanding the Holy Spirit as God's set apart or separate power, well, in this instance, God's power is being used in a deliberate way in relation to Mary. And she is going to conceive and she is going to have a holy child who is going to be known as the Son of God. Simple point, but the Holy Spirit isn't just God's power, it's being described as a special application of God's power. And again, I don't think we need to overcomplicate that. It's easy to understand, and there's a direct application, which was the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, if we go across to um, Luke chapter 3, we see a, another um, instance, just follows on quite logically, um, verse 21 of chapter 3, when all the people were baptised, it came to pass that Jesus also being baptised and praying, the heaven was opened and the Holy Spirit descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven and said, you are my beloved son, in, in thee I am well pleased. So in this dramatic way, the witnesses to this event can see a dove, which is, as it were, a, a manifestation, just so that they can understand that, that Jesus was going to be endowed with God's special power. And in this instance, we understand God's special power because it's manifest in his ministry, in miracles, in the preaching and the prophesying that he does. And it is that Holy Spirit that is given to Jesus that supports him and uh, encourages him and comforts him through his ministry. And, and, and we can look at passage after passage all the way through the Gospels that record the extraordinary application of the Holy Spirit in the ministry of Jesus. And again, just to repeat ourselves so it's quite clear, the Holy Spirit is God's separately uh, used power. And in this instance, it's for the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's evident to everybody who can see because the dove was there and the blessing of God is heard from the heavens. Now, I'm going to jump you forward to a passage that I'm sure you would go to now. And we'll spend maybe a little bit of time looking at this. Acts chapter 2, okay? And, and we could have had a reading, Tim. <laughs> we could have read a large part of Acts chapter 2, and in a minute we could have read a large part of Acts chapter 8. But um, uh, I, th I think we know these passages. And, and we're familiar with the Feast of Pentecost, and, and we're familiar with the Holy Spirit gifts being given, verse 3 of Acts chapter 2, um, to the, the apostles. There appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they are all filled with the Holy Spirit. Simple fact. There's, there, there's another, as it were, um, physical uh, attribution, so that it's quite clear where the gift is given. And then there's a, a manifestation of that gift, because it's described. What happened? They were all filled with the Holy Spirit, God's specifically set apart power, and they begin to speak in other tongues. Old English word, we could read that as other languages. Just as the Spirit, God's power, gave them utterance. So all of those present are given the Holy Spirit, God's particular power, 
And the reason is immediately obvious, because they can suddenly speak in foreign languages. Well, why was this done? Well, just as the Holy Spirit was given to Jesus to support him through his ministry, the apostles now have the obligation to go out into the world and preach. That's Mark chapter 16 and verse 15. And to do that, they have the Holy Spirit gift. Its application is interesting, though. Why? Verse 5. There were dwelling at Jerusalem devout men out of every nation under heaven. So it's a cosmopolitan place at this point in time. People from every nation in the world. Now, when the Holy Spirit gift and, and the ability to speak in different languages was heard around, when this was noised abroad, verse 6, everybody comes rushing together. The multitude comes together and they're confounded. They're surprised. They're amazed. They're astounded. Why? Because everyone heard them speak in his own language. Didn't hear him speak in some foreign tongue, which was unintelligible. They, the, the apostles are speaking in, I don't know, um, maybe there were some Spaniards there. Maybe there were some from, from, from India, from the trading nations, from all around Egypt. And they can understand the language. We know from later in the passage that there are people there from Ethiopia. What do they say? They were all amazed and marvel, saying one to another, aren't these Galileans? They're, they're sort of ignorant backcountry folk. But, but there would be some local um, slur attached with maybe these northerners who, who weren't too bright. But anyway, the point is, it's amazing because aren't all these people Galileans and yet we hear everyone in our own language where we were born and then just to get the, the the geography parthians medes elamites mesopotamians judeans cappadocia pontus asia phrygia pamphylia egypt libya cyrene rome jews Pros all of this mix cretes and arabians um they're all there and they all understand the language what does it say verse 11 we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. And they're all amazed. And they say, you know, what does this mean? And others say, well, they're just drunk. But, but that's, that's another slur, isn't it? Because, because if people were drunk, they're, they're not readily intelligible. And you certainly wouldn't say, they're telling me about the wonderful works of God. So the Holy Spirit gift was was clearly given and there was a, a direct purpose and that was to make known the gospel the wonderful work of God so there, there we have it by by summary the Holy Spirit possession was unmistakable fishermen uneducated were able to speak in foreign languages it was for the the furtherance of God's will and what's more, it also fulfills prophecy if we went further into the chapter. We're not going to do that. But again, I'll just pick up 1 Corinthians 12. Again, it's not necessary to know all of this, but it's interesting because this is the sort of way other churches today will say that they have the Holy Spirit. So... Verse 4 of 1 Corinthians 12 tells us that there are diversities of gifts, the same spirit, it's the same power, but it's manifest in lots of different ways. It's not helpful in the New Testament that that, that word pneuma is translated sometimes with a capital S and, and other times without it. And that capitalization is, is put there by the translators. It, it's not there in the original language. So, so the translators have added a little bit of, let's say, doubt to how we understand the idea of the Holy Spirit. But then the, the, the list of the spirits as such, verse 8. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, another faith, another the gifts of healing, the working of miracles, prophecy, the discerning of spirits to understand other people's gifts to another diverse kinds of languages which is what we saw in Acts chapter 2 and then the interpretation of languages all of these work 
that one and the selfsame spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. So God's power is given as there is need. And it's given in a number of ways. And, and that is also confirmed then um, in, in Hebrews and, and chapter 2 and verse 4, which, again, you don't need to, to do this, but this goes back to God bearing them witness with signs, wonders, diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his will. So that's, as it were, a summary reference of what I've just touched. The Holy Spirit is clear, it's used in a direct application, and it's given by God to further his needs. So let's have another look at this. I said we'd look at Acts chapter 2, we're now going to look at Acts chapter 8. And again, it's another, as it were, Sunday school lesson, so you'll be familiar with it. But, but this, is, this is concerning a rather devious gentleman by the name of Simon and, and Philip. And, and the passage in Acts chapter 8 picks off in, in verse 4. Um, that great mass of humanity that we read about in Acts chapter 2 have been distributed. Verse 4, Therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. So the people who had understood and were baptised in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 2 and 3, they go home and they spread the gospel with them. Philip went down to Samaria and he preaches the, the gospel there. And there's no surprise. The people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles he did. So Philip has been given the gift of the Holy Spirit and that supports him in his ministry to do the will of Christ, which was to preach the gospel in the world as they went. And, and then you've got the description again. Unclean spirits uh, uh, crying with loud voice, well, th they are healed. They come out of many that were possessed. Many with, taken with palsies, well, they that were lame, they're, they're all healed. And as a consequence, there's great joy. There's no surprise there. And, and there's this, as I say, devious man called Simon. And, and he'd made his living, living using sorcery, um, basically scamming the, the, the local population in Samaria. And, and verse 8 says that giving out that himself was some great one. He'd used sorcery, he'd bewitched in, in, in Old Testament English, or old, old English, New Testament as it is here. But his power was unmistakable. To whom, verse 10, they all gave heed. From the least to the greatest, saying, this, is the, this man is the great power of God. So they've got, they've got Philip who comes into town with the gospel and does unmistakably good things which bring joy associated with the gospel. And then you've got this con man who's made out that he's a godly man and that he could do great things. Verse 11 um, just, just repeats the, 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 the same mantra. They had regard for Simon because he had bewitched them with sorceries. But when the Samaritans, verse 12, believe Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they respond positively. They're baptised both men and women. And Simon himself believes, verse 13, he's baptised and he stays with Philip and he's, unsurprisingly, he's interested in what Philip's doing. Um, he wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. So, so this is the con man and he, he's been put out of business and he's a bit concerned and he's watching Philip because it all seems a bit real. Um, when the apostles, verse 14, which were at Jerusalem, heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John, who, when, verse 15, when they were come, they, they pray so that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Now that's interesting, isn't it? Philip had the Holy Spirit and, and achieved many, many successes, as it were, in sharing the gospel. But... To share the Holy Spirit gift with the Samaritans, you've got to call in Peter and John. What, why is that necessary? Well, the scripture will explain to us. When they were come, they received the Holy Spirit. So it's only when Peter and John are there 
Verse 16 brackets, always useful, they explain. As yet, the, the Holy Spirit was fallen on none of them. They had only been baptised in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then laid they their hands on them, so that's Peter and John, and the Samaritans received the Holy Spirit. That's all quite straightforward. So there were those apostles in the upper room who received the Holy Spirit at the Feast of Pentecost. And it would appear that they are the only people who can pass the Holy Spirit to someone else. Philip, who had received the Holy Spirit, doesn't have that ability. And Simon is a cunning old man. Verse 18, when Simon understands this, he saw that through laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Spirit was given, money appears. He offers them money. So the penny drops. So, so Philip's got this power, but really he's not the real person I want to, to influence. I, I, I want to get to Peter and John, who have the ability to share that power. And I could make a lot of money doing that. So he says, verse 19, give, give me also this power that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Spirit. Quite blunt, blatant avarice. But Peter said unto him, thy money perish with thee because you have thought that the gift of God can be purchased with money. So the Holy Spirit is a gift of God to progress the gospel. Simon's intentions are completely ungodly. He, he wanted to have the gift of God, but he wanted it for his own benefit. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, verse 21, your heart is not right in the sight of God. You, Simon, are ungodly. Quite clear. Instruction, repent therefore of this thy wickedness and pray God if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. That's a natural process. If we sin, we want to correct our ways, we repent, we talked about that this morning, and change our ways and live in a godly way. Verse 23, for I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. It's, it's a fantastic put down. <laughs> you're a sour man and you're full of sin. You're, you're a bad, uh, grumpy man. And, and, and he, he's given his instruction. And, and Simon hears that and his response is, pray to the Lord for me. Um, that may be self-preservation, and, and we don't have the record to support what actually happens to Simon in the rest of his life. But verse 25, when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem and preached the gospel elsewhere in many villages of the Samaritans. Why do I go through that in such detail? Because I think it's important. If those apostles in that other room were the only people who could pass the Holy Spirit on, what's going to happen? So they give the Holy Spirit to Philip. Philip can't give it to anybody else. So, so the people who receive the Holy Spirit, that's it. Because when the, the 12 are dead, they're not able to pass the Holy Spirit gifts on. So do we expect to see the Holy Spirit even in 200 AD, let alone 2000 and? It's unlikely. The Holy Spirit gifts, as we understand them, were going to disappear. Now, th there's good reason for that. We, we have the Holy Scriptures now. And, and, and the Holy Scriptures were in large part compiled by 200 AD. We already know that the, the, the Old Testament was freely available. So the Holy Spirit had been given to the authors of the Holy Scriptures. And as it were the audience that were there in the first century AD, well, those following them had, had got the record through God's Holy Spirit in the written word. The New Testament tells us the same message again, though. It's not just a practical understanding of that incident in, in Acts chapter 8, but 1, 1 Corinthians 13 tells us quite clearly, and again, we, we, we just need to use our head here, um, Verse 8, talking about the Holy Spirit, we've already looked at chapter 12 where we, we saw the list of the, the Spirit gifts. But verse 8 tells us, 
Charity or love never fails. But whether there be prophecies, they'll fail. Tongues, well, they'll cease. Knowledge, it, it shall vanish away. Quite clear, these are the gifts that are lifted in, listed in the previous chapter. But they're going to vanish. That's what it says. Now, there's no misunderstanding with the word vanish. They're here and then they're gone. So, so when those with the Holy Spirit gifts had passed, they'd fallen asleep, they'd died. Well, that was pretty much the end of the Holy Spirit in that application as God had given it. So it's not just understanding the practical application in Acts chapter 8, but it's understanding what the scripture tells us as well. And, and we could go to, to Micah and, and see the prophecy there. So we, we're left in a bit of a conundrum. Time's gone. I've spoken for far too long. I apologise. I've, I've got one, I think one last reference for you. You can look for the, for the epistle of, of John chapter 4, the fir first epistle. So spirit, we understand, it, it, it's God's power. It's God's gift. And, and, and it's also shown in humankind in its own way. So we saw the, the emotion and the, and the drive and the application in, in the New Testament. We, we saw what God did with his power. He created. He, he still sustains the world. He's in charge. He's omnipotent, all-powerful. But there is a practical application of, the, of God's power in separate ways. And we've seen that in, in, the, in, in the application with, with the Pentecost and, and thereafter, with Jesus and then after Pentecost. So, first of John chapter 4. We're, we're looking at the world today, and, and I put that poster up, and there are people who claim to have Holy Spirit gifts. If Isaac was here, he'd tell you about the, the predominant influence of religion and politics in America and how that's based out of the evangelical church, and that is all on the proviso that God's Spirit has given me the ability to go and do this with Donald Trump in, in, in the Republican Party. And, and, and I'm not being political, that's a factual statement. Um, so there are lots of people in churches and, and others, like Simon, who, who are trying to misuse or give the, the, the impression that they have God's power, and that therefore is an endorsement for the way they're trying to lead the world. First of John chapter 4. Beloved, believe not every spirit. Try the spirits whether they are of God. So if I had gone to that football stadium in Douala to see that pastor doing all these gifts, things that are, are wonderful... If that was really the case, do we not think that it would do more? It would make the news, it would be verifiable, it would be recorded. It, it, it's a sham, it's a con. Test the spirits whether they are of God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Okay? So we've got to be careful. And, and that's why I wanted to talk about this. And that's why it's important as young people, particularly, you understand what sets us apart from other beliefs and believers in, in Christ. And also, hopefully, some of the stuff I've said will help others think about how they can maybe talk to others where, where there's opportunity. So there are many false prophets. So there are lots of people who, who, who are perpetuating Simon's scam. But verse 2, hereby know ye the Spirit of God. So this is how we know God's power. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. Every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. So quite clearly, if people who claim to have the Holy Spirit act in other ungodly ways... Well, the claim to have the Holy Spirit is, is a sham and a con anyway. They've, they've failed the test. It's not unlike the prophet's test of the Old Testament. And then we see this is the spirit of Antichrist. And, and we could get all worked up about that as a phrase as well. But Antichrist is of, of oppositing, acting in an opposite way to a Christ-like example. So it's quite clear. We don't need to go all satanic on that. 
you are either for or against. You, you make the decision as to whether you are in a godly um, frame of mind and action, and that is your ambition and desire. Otherwise, you are already, it said, in the world. You are ungodly and acting against the gospel of Christ. So we, we have some decisions to make. We, we have this test. We can see what goes on in the world. It's a challenge, but quite simply, the Bible tells us plainly. Acts chapter 8 is really blunt about how the Holy Spirit gifts were obtained and passed on. And, and just a clear understanding of the scripture and, and God's power will give us a good understanding of the principles that God would want us to follow. Thank you for joining us. We hope you found the episode helpful. Don't forget, most of these episodes are also available as videos on our video channel, cdvideo.org. So head over and take a look. If you have any comments or questions or suggestions, please get in touch or leave us a voice message. We love to hear your feedback. You can email us at bt f at cdvideo.org if you enjoyed the episode then please share it with others until next time may god bless you in your studies and your walk towards god's kingdom amen